you said, I am uh, here for more than a year. Yes. <laughs> My last <laughs> time I'm here is last year. So it's already one year. <laughs> so, thank God for his faithfulness to every one of us. I saw new faces and old faces. So thank you for, we thank God for uh, his faithfulness to each and every one of us in the past uh, days. So we are closing now on the topic uh, about the book of Genesis. <clears throat> so it's only three chapter of four chapter. Yeah, it's only four chapter and I uh, will be consuming two hours. You will exceed our time because it's long. It's a long uh, sermon. <clears throat> Let us pray. Father, we thank you, God, for this wonderful time that you have given us, so God. Thank you, Lord, for your faithfulness, for your goodness in the life of thy people, oh God. Lord, we thank you, Lord, for this time, oh God, that we, we will hear again thy message preached, Lord. We ask your Holy Spirit, oh God, that uh, uh, you will read us and give us the wisdom so that we can understand, Lord, the last part of uh, the book of Genesis, oh God. And as we continue in our study, the last part of Genesis, oh God, to help us to see um, your uh, message going on, help us to see the principles and the lesson that we may learn for, uh, for this uh, last chapters of Genesis of God, and that only we will hear this, O God, but we will apply this in our lives as we continue in our journey, in our Christian life. Lord, help us, and uh, uh, you, your name will glorify in our midst today. As John the Baptist said, I will be in peace, and I will be in peace, and you will be in peace. Thank you, Father, in Jesus' mighty name. Amen. Amen. <clears throat> so the title of our message today is God meant it for good. And this is the Old Testament version of Romans 8.28. <clears throat> and we know that all things work together for good to those who love God, to those who are the called according to His purpose. That is our scripture reading. So I will not read them in detail our text because it's a long, it will consume uh, time. So along the, the, the sermon, just follow up the verses which we are uh, about to uh, look. As a recap, Genesis, the book of Genesis, answered the question how did it all begin? No. When we are looking for the book, maybe we noticed that from the beginning we saw. It's in the garden. But at the end of the gen of Genesis chapter 50, we saw there a coffin to a coffin in Egypt. From garden to coffin. <clears throat> it starts with the creation and the, and the first man and woman without sin in the garden of Eden. It ends in Joseph in the coffin in Egypt. Of course, the five book events which led from the glorious beginning of that of that disturbing conclusion was the fall of the human race into sin. Genesis graphically portrays the effect of sins on, on human race, but it also shows God great mercy in redeeming fallen man and called out a people for his purpose. <clears throat> a child for his blessing to all nations. 
So Moses, the author, is supplying the historical basis to God's covenant with his people Israel. He wanted them to know where they had come from and where they were going. God had promised Canaan to them that there was a future for them in Egypt or in the wilderness. So Moses wrote Genesis to show Israel that they must, by faith and obedience, go forward to conquer the land. <clears throat> so Genesis hints at the hints at the call of Abraham in chapter 12 into two major sections. It's with four subsections. The first section is the what they call the human history from Adam to Abraham. The beginning of the human race from chapter 11, from chapter 1 to chapter 11. Chapter 1 to chapter 2, we saw this the creation. Chapter 3, the fall. And chapter 4 to 9, the flood. Then chapter 10 to 11 is the dispersion sin after the flood. And the second section is they call it human history from Abraham to Joseph from chapter 12 to chapter 15. <clears throat> in chapter 12 to 24, it's about Abraham. It's talking about Abraham. And uh, chapter 25 to 26 is the shortest uh, chapter. It's talk about Isaac. <clears throat> and chapter 27 to 36, it's talk about Jacob. <clears throat> and the last part, Chapter 37 to 50 is talked about Joseph. <clears throat> so the sovereign hand of God over human history is a major emphasis in all these events. By reading Genesis, God's people can see that he is beyond, behind all their history. He's the one who has brought them to where they are. And he has promised many blessings regarding their future. And yet God sovereignty doesn't negate human responsibility as it demonstrates in the lives and the character of Genesis. Today we are bringing to study the uh, great man of God who close this is uh, in the life of Joseph life of Joseph has been a series of trials and tragedy. Tragedy. I know you are advanced in reading the Bible. And you already read from Genesis to Revelation. <clears throat> so you, you, can, you can recall the story of Joseph. He has been a road mark by many valleys and mountains. <clears throat> now, when have seen the difficult life he had as a child, he had witnesses the hatred and cruelty of his brothers. We have seen him working as a slave. We have seen him falsely accused and imprisoned. We have seen him abandoned and forgotten in the prison. <clears throat> we have also seen him taken out of the prison and elevated to a position of prestige, <clears throat> power, and prominence in Egypt. He watched as Joseph was reunited with his brothers. We saw God use him to bring his brother to a place of repentance. We saw him reunite with his father. <clears throat> we have seen all the highs and lows of Joseph's life. <clears throat> and through every valley, and across every mountains, one truth held true. God meant it for good. Even as Joseph nears the end of his life, in these verses, he continued to display a remarkable faith in God. It is that faith and confidence that we want to look at today in our chapter as we continue studying the book of Genesis. <clears throat> so in chapter 47, when you see the 
uh, that Moses written this the word you think why he write these words and he include this in Genesis what's the importance of this uh, chapter to the, the readers and to us also <clears throat> in chapter 47 Joseph introduced his family to Pharaoh <clears throat> and God prosper Joseph families in Egypt <clears throat> so how we will make God and his purpose to prosper in our lives as we are here in earth <clears throat> first commit ourselves to make God and his purpose proper <clears throat> prosper and we will make and he will make us truly prosper in other ways of saying seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all these things shall be added unto us that is your favorite verse in Matthew 6 33 it's easy to say but it's hard or difficult to apply <clears throat> When the final buzzer sounds, what mother is God and his purpose? If we commit ourselves for him, he will take care of our things and <clears throat> things we need. The question is, how do we do that in the midst of life's pressures? How do I order my life to make God and his purpose prosper? I like to outline three, uh, three ways so that we can see how the God's how God and His part was prosper in our lives. In Genesis forty six, or the last verses thirty one to Genesis forty seven, so uh, verse to six, Joseph prepares his brother. For interview to Pharaoh and there is an interview itself <clears throat> so it shows us that uh, it shows us the principle of distinctness distinct distinctness no. Joseph want their family to stay in Gosen far from the city of Egypt <clears throat> we know how is the life in the city compared to the province so Joseph don't want that his family is with the busy the busy life of Egypt Jacob meet and bless Pharaoh and Joseph administered the famine relief program over Egypt so here we see the two principles it shows the principles of blessing to others which God already promised to Abraham long time ago that Abraham seeds will be a blessing to others and not only to Abraham promised that we they will be a blessing to others even for us God promised that we will be a blessing to others <clears throat> and the second principle in 47 27 31 is Jacob needs near death <clears throat> after later of 17 years he asked Joseph to promise that he will bury his him in Canaan, not Egypt. Why not Egypt? They are they prosper in Egypt. Why he want to bury in Canaan? Because Jacob show us the principle of priorities. That is Jacob. <clears throat> he knows his priorities. Then God promised them to the, the land of Canaan, then Jacob did not forget the promise of God and to make it priority in his life. If you want to make God and his purpose prosper by being distinct unto him, we are being distinct. <clears throat> Joseph's brothers came into the land 
with their flocks and herds, Joseph needed to inform Pharaoh the, <clears throat> and gain his consent for them to live in the land of Bosem. <clears throat> you, if you remember that shepherding is a hateful job for the Egyptian. They see that shepherding is, they are considered as low, lowest in the society. <clears throat> For God's passport, for God's purpose was to fulfill Israel, they must be a distinct to the nation, set apart unto Him. So Joseph's concern was that God's people, Joseph's family, maintain the distinctiveness in spite of the ridicule that may come from the Egyptian. One of the greatest needs of God's people today is that we be distinct from the world. Are we distinct from this world? Set apart unto God. The biblical, the biblical term for is holiness. No? It grieves us when we hear some Christians acting the same as the world acts. <clears throat> When Christians are, are when Christian use abusive speech toward their mates or children or neighbors, when they are dishonest, not only in business but also in our workplace, when they lead a selfish pursuit, when they are morally impure, the soul has lost its favor. favor. <clears throat> We are grieved to hear that some Christians are seeing what the world asks. <clears throat> Biblical holiness starts with the way we think, <clears throat> where we stand when they are when we stand apart from our culture, are lived to please God according to His word. But that's not going to happen. If we spend 20 hours in a week sitting in tube or Facebook and one hour meditating the Word of God, it will not be happen that we will be holy as God told us to be holy. Our time for things not <coughs> Uh, not for the God, for the things of God is more than than for the things of God. You are spending much time for other things than for the things of God. <clears throat> Second principle that we will see on chapter seven is we make God and His purpose prosper by by being a blessing to others by being a blessing to others in verses 7 to 26 of chapter 47 we read there that Joseph present age father present his age father to Pharaoh and Jacob blessed Pharaoh <clears throat> When we see Pharaoh prospering under Joseph's administration of the famine relief, each of us has the same blessing to offer to every person we meet. We can offer that person the good news of Jesus Christ. We've got what, what person needs and we shouldn't be intimidated by all the outward staff that doesn't matter to God. Jacob, he was going to die soon, but he lived for, for 17 more years. Some people think they, some people think they, they are at death's door, but God will give them many more years. <clears throat> but some people think they have many more years, but they, they're unknowingly at that store. <clears throat> we don't know 
how long we are going to live. We need to live each day in light of eternity, redeeming the time by blessing others with the good news of Christ. <clears throat> Jacob's blessing in words was fulfilled in deeds by Joseph, wise administration on Pharaoh's behalf. That's what God wants us to be in <clears throat> our world. Whether at work, in the neighbor, or wherever we are, he wants us to be a blessing to others. <clears throat> he wants us to seek the best interest of our employer, our fellow employees at work. He wants us to be his child of blessing, those around us, our neighbors, our fellows, fellow workers, and to everybody. You can only do that if you maintain our integrity to a close walk with God, as Jacob has did. <clears throat> You do it both through, through our words, as Jacob did, and to our deeds, as Joseph did. <clears throat> our job reveals a lot about our character. It shows whether we are lazy, greedy, given to deception, under pressures, whether we can get along with people if you gossip, if you compromise your standard when it's expedient. <clears throat> Christians often presume that their Christian employers for pay for. After all, we are brothers in the Lord. He will understand if I take time of my job. But we don't do that unless the boss will give us permission. <clears throat> And third, we must make God's and His purpose prosper by keeping our priorities right when God prosper us. <clears throat> keeping our priorities right when God prosper us. That's from 37 to 31 of chapter 47 of Genesis. So Jacob's final 17 years were probably best the best years of his life, he had his children restored to him, his extended family prospered, it would have been easy for him to think Egypt isn't such a bad place. <clears throat> We've had a good life here. God has taken care of us. <clears throat> Let's just settle it in for the long haul. But instead, as he came the, near to death, he called Joseph and made him swear that he would bury him in Canaan, not in Egypt. <clears throat> he wanted his posterity to remember that God promised involved Canaan. <clears throat> he didn't want them to settle indefinitely in Egypt. That took some faith on Jacob's part. <clears throat> It had been over 200 years since God had promised Canaan to Abraham. His grandson Jacob is dying in Egypt with no tangible indication <coughs> that God promised about Canaan will be fulfilled. But in spite of his prosperity in Egypt, Jacob kept his priorities is straight. <clears throat> the good life in Egypt can never compare to the blessing of the promised land. <clears throat> but we will all face the danger of becoming captivated with the goodies of Egypt and forgetting what we are looking for the heavenly cities to come. <clears throat> God has graciously prospered us in this world we must remember that our purpose for being here is not to accumulate things, <clears throat> the things Egypt 
has to offer or the world has to offer. We are here to be a blessing to others. The person, <coughs> we are here to further God's purpose to communicate the good news of Jesus Christ to every tribes and tongues and nations. <clears throat> the person who by faith lays up treasures in heaven is truly prosperous. As Jesus pointed out, he has something that the world cannot give or take away. That's the message of the chapter 47 for us, for us to be a blessing to others as Jacob and Joseph had done in, as God used them in Egypt. <clears throat> so we go to the chapter 48 of the book of Genesis. <laughs> chapter 48 of Genesis we see grandson Jacob handling his heritage in God to his sons Joseph and his grandson Manasseh and Ephraim sons of Joseph he had up Joseph two sons as his own as his own blessing Joseph to them <clears throat> out of all events recorded in Jacob's long life the author of Hebrews selected the epistle this epistle at his Example of Jacob's faith. In Hebrews 11.21, by faith Jacob, as he was dying, blessed each of the son of Joseph and worship, leaning on the top of his staff. Jacob had not yet received the fulfillment of God's promises, but he blessed his two young men, believing that God would keep his promise. <coughs> To them. In the act of faith, we see Jacob imparting to his son and grandson the most important things he could have given to them, namely faith in the promises of God. From this chapter, we learn that the most important thing we can give to our children and grandchildren is a godly heritage. A godly heritage is the most important things we can share or we can give to our children and grandchildren. <clears throat> we give a godly heritage by taking a spiritual concern not only for our children but also to our grandchildren. <clears throat> Jacob adopt his two, his two grandsons of his own sons and impart his blessing to them with Jacob as well as with his father Esau before him. The blessing was reserved for a special occasion. It was more than just a father prayer for the well-being of his son. It was an actual imparting of well-being based on a special divine and divine prophetic insights about the spiritual future of the sons. In verse 48 of chapter 15, it says that Jacob blessed, blessed Joseph. But as you go on to read the blessing, you discover that Jacob blessed <coughs> Jacob by being, by blessing Joseph's sons. <clears throat> parents are truly blessed when their parents take a concern for a spiritual well-being of their grandchildren. Since God's purpose is hands the generation, our goal should be raised up godly generation <clears throat> not only through our children but also through their children <clears throat> grandparents who love the Lord are a great gift to a child 
they can sometimes impart spiritual fruit to our kids in a way we can. <clears throat> and they reinforce the spiritual values which we're trying to impart. All Christians are concerned for the spiritual well-being of our children and grandchildren, but they don't always communicate their concern properly. Sometimes we do. We are uh, we are happy to con the concern of the spiritual being of our children, but we are not communicating properly to them. We must teach God's standards, but we must do it with tenderness and affection. <laughs> People of any age, especially children, learn best when they feel love and when they hear kind and encouraging words. <clears throat> Here Jacob spent encouraging words to his two grands, grandson. He drew them near to himself, kisses and embraces them. <clears throat> then he lays his hands on them to be a to, as he blessed them through his words, through his expression, and his affectionate thoughts, Jacob made his grandson feel love. <clears throat> but sometimes we are correcting our children, they don't feel love. Every time we correct our children, they must feel love in our way of correction. <clears throat> <clears throat> then later gave up their Egyptian culture and royal upbringing and identified themselves with the shepherd band of the, the despised band of shepherds who were waiting for the promise says of God <clears throat> so we gave a godly heritage to our children and God children by recounting to them our own experience says with God. We assume of course that we are walking with God as Christian. <clears throat> Jacob went through his ups and downs, but through it, through it all, he had walked with God. When Joseph came to see his to see him on his deathbed. Jacob recalled how God had appeared to him at Luz or Bethel and the promises God and the promises God had made to him there. Once Jacob expressed his gratitude that God had allowed him to see not only Joseph but also Joseph's children. Then in blessing his grandson Jacob recounted God's faithfulness and goodness in his life. <clears throat> tell them, tell to our children and grandchildren God's covenant faithfulness toward us. <clears throat> Even in Jacob's great times of sorrow, when Rachel died, God's confront had been real. The pain of the loss was still with the old man as he remains here, but God been with him. Then the hammer blows of Joseph's loss had hit the grieving man. He had thought that he would never see Joseph again. He went through years of confusion, wondering how the loss of his sons of his son who seems to follow the Lord will fit in with the promises of God. But now, at the end of his journey, God had proved himself faithful. As Jacob held in his arms not only Joseph, but Joseph's son, two sons, and so he blesses his grandson. Jacob tells them how God has been his shepherd, has his life 
to the day and how God will be with them. When our families look at our lives, are they inclined to say, God is your faithful, isn't he? When our children and grandchildren look at our life, they can say that God is faithful to us. Or would they say, God must not be very good because my dad, my grandfather are always complaining about the treatment he's getting. Complainers tell others something untrue about God. <coughs> Namely that he isn't faithful. Kids are a skill in reading between the lines of our lives. If we profess to know the Lord, but our lives are a constant complaint, then they put it together and make a mental note that they don't want anything to do with our God. We've got to tell them by our words and our attitude that God is faithful even though through even through the hard times of life. Tell them, tell to our children and grandchildren God's great salvation. <clears throat> Jacob called God the angel who has redeemed me from the evil in verse 16 of chapter 48. He was probably thinking primarily of his experience in Mahanaim when the angels come around him to protect him from Laban. And then when the angel wrestled with him at Pinyel just prior to him to his fear reunion with Esau. He here equates his, this angel with God. <clears throat> so believe that this angel of God is the Lord Jesus Christ. <clears throat> if the four relatives have to tell part of his property or even sell himself into substitute in order to survive, <clears throat> the redeemed could buy back the relative's property or the relative himself thus restoring him his freedom. That's the meaning for them to be redeemed. That's a beautiful picture of what God did for us in Christ. We were enslaved and slave to sin with no way to, to free ourselves. The price was more than we could ever afford. But God sent our Redeemer, the Lord Jesus Christ, to love us and paid us the price with, with his own blood. It's a story that we need to tell to our children and grandchildren over and over again. They need to know that we once were lost in sin, but that Christ had saved us. They need to know that they need Christ as their Redeemer. <clears throat> and we tell them of God's amazing grace. <clears throat> In blessing his grandson Jacob deliberately cross his hands. <clears throat> so his right hands to the younger and his left hands to the older. <clears throat> Instead of an Manasseh, it's to Abraham, the right hand. As Joseph had planned, when Joseph tried to correct his father, the old man said, I know my son. I know. Why did Jacob do that? Because God had revealed to Jacob that Abraham would take prominence over Manasseh among the tribes of Israel. This, <clears throat> in fact, it didn't happen for hundreds of years. Even in Moses' days, Manasseh outnumbered 
Ephraim by more than 20,000. When we look at Numbers 26 verses 34 and 37, Moses showed his faith in recording this prophecy which was yet fulfilled in his days. But finally, Ephraim did grow larger and more prominent than Manasseh fulfilling Jacob's prophecy. Jacob was illustrating a divine principle which we had learned that God bless us apart from any merit of our part. God blesses us apart from any merit of our part. <clears throat> the word would have picked the skillful archer Ismael, but God did quiet Isaac. The word would have picked the rugged outdoors man Esau, but God picked the conniving Jacob. The word would have picked the older Manasseh, but God picked the younger Ephraim. Why doesn't God operate on the marriage system? Why doesn't he choose the most scripted, gifted, intelligent, upright, promising people of his church? Paul says in 1 Corinthians chapter 1, 26 to 30, Paul tells us that he does it to shame the wisdom of this world so that no one can boast before God. Grace doesn't operate on the basis of human merit, but on the basis of God's sovereign choice. <clears throat> the clay has no right to question the Father. Why do you make me like this? In Romans 9.20, <clears throat> God gave us what we deserve we would all go straight to hell. We must learn to humble ourselves before the sovereign God and grateful receive His grace. <clears throat> Rather than grumble about why someone else seems to get better treatment than I, <clears throat> than we, <clears throat> so we impart a godly heritage to our children <clears throat> and grandchildren by taking a spiritual concern for them and by recounting to them our experience with God. And finally, we give the godly heritage in victory to our children and grandchildren, our hope for their future in the Lord. <clears throat> if you were a refuge shepherd and had two grandsons, who had, seen, who had been raised in the palace is the most advanced nation of the earth. What kind of future would you hope for those boys? It would have been so natural for Jacob to wish for them all the privilege <clears throat> that the court of Egypt offered. They had all the comfort of wealth and opportunities for power and prestige. We wonder if their mother from the well-known Egyptian family would have been horrified to think of her sons being identified with a despised shepherd of Israel rather than with a high political circle in Egypt. You're throwing away your career in Egypt for what? But by faith, Jacob picture for this grandson a future in which they were identified with the covenant people of God. <clears throat> Jacob believed that God, God for the fulfillment of things not yet seen. Then Jacob by faith paint a picture of Joseph's futures in the Lord. He says, I am about to die, but God will be with you and bring you back to the land of your fathers. As God peoples in our days, we need to picture for our children the great purpose of completing the task of world evangelization before the Lord's coming. 
We do not truly bless our children if we encourage them to worldly success instead of success with God. We need to encourage our kids to follow the Lord with all their lives, with all the, the whole, whole heart. But at the same time, realize that the Lord may not want them to be what we want them to be. That's the message, the lesson and principles that we can learn in chapter 48 of Genesis imparting to our children our experience to God tell them our uh, God's salvation God's uh, <clears throat> amazing grace <clears throat> and God's faithfulness to us by showing them in our words and deeds <clears throat> now we go to the chapter 49 of Genesis <laughs> Chapter 49. They have always found it curious that both Christian and non Christians are fascinated with prophecies. To be, to be interested in prophecies is good, since much of the Bible, much of the Bible is prophetic. The point of prophecy is to motivate us to purify and holy seal for the things of the Lord in light of His coming. When we come to Jacob's prophecies regarding his sons in this chapter, we have asked what was the purpose of these prophecies to this man. Most of them did not live long enough to see them fulfilled. Judah is predicted to become the leader with his father's sons blowing the, bowing down to him. But in this lifetime, Judah and his brothers continue to bow down before Joseph. <clears throat> so why did Jacob reveal these things to his sons? <laughs> Another important question we need to ask, why did Moses <clears throat> think this prophecy is prophetic significance enough to record them in Genesis chapter 49 as the fledgling nation was about to enter Canaan. With those questions, we'll see the answer as we go in studying this chapter. <clears throat> How do these prophecies apply to us? What was the purpose of these prophecies for Jacob's sons first? As we mentioned <clears throat> on the past chapters, none of the sons of Jacob lived, lived to see the fulfillment of these prophecies. They all died in Egypt. So why did Jacob give them these words? The, te the text gives us some clues. When you look at verse 28 of this chapter, state that these were blessing appropriate to its man. Further in verse 1 when we read, we state that this blessing were prediction of what would befall each son in the future, <clears throat> which implies beyond their lifetime. <clears throat> First, the word shows Jacob's sons that God was going to build their families into tribes and those tribes into, into a nation. Further from the tribes of Judah would come a ruler to whom would be the obedience of the peoples. In verse 10 of this chapter. So J Jacob was raising their vision from their current circumstances as bands of families trying to survive in Egypt to show them God's plan for history and how they and their families fit into that plan. Second, effect of these prophecies on Jacob's son was to show them 
that their character affect uh, their own and their descendants' destinies. destinies. So these prophecies were based in part of Jacob's observation of each of his sons over their lifetime. He knew the strength and weaknesses of each of these men. Its prophecy takes into account the uniqueness of each son. Remember, for the Hebrews, names were significant. <clears throat> They often were given a prophecies of hopes for the child's future. Here, in conjunction with Jacob's observation to each of his sons, the Holy Spirit gives him prophetic insight into the direction each son's character would lead his tribes descendant from him. So Jacob's sons should have learned that character affects destiny, not only for us, but for our descendants also. <clears throat> God has determined a plan for each man and his descendants, then what the, then what can anybody do to thwart it? But as we saw with, uh, with Levi, when a man and his family turns to the Lord, even a seeming curse can be turned into blessings. <clears throat> Jacob predicted that Levi would be scattered in Israel, and that proves true. But Levi's descendants were scattered, scattered as priests <clears throat> who were channels for God's truth to be disseminated among to be disseminated among Israel. Its opportunity to turn, it was the same in each of these sons and their promises. While God over all plan was fixed, each individual had the opportunity to turn to the Lord and be used of Him in blessing the nations. It's the tension between God's sovereignty and human responsibility. God's plan is irrevocable. <clears throat> but He gives us moral responsibilities so that we can choose to participate in His plan or turn against it. <clears throat> then what was the purpose of this prophecies for Moses first reader <clears throat> Moses showed Genesis for a battling nation of, of the stubborn and often unbelieving people who were poised to the edge of Canaan ready to go in and conquer this land with God has promised to Abraham and his descendant they were selfish love who easily could have lost the land by getting in foolish squabbles with each other. They were a worldly-minded bond who could easily get into the land, settle down to enjoy the material comfort and forget the Lord and His purposes to them. So many of the same purpose which these prophecies had Jacob sons applied to Moses' readers and for us also. <clears throat> for one thing, Moses wanted his reader to view their current circumstances in light of God's plan. They faced difficult battles in order to conquer Canaan. It wasn't going to peace of Cape, but in the nation lost sight of God's promises to give that land to Abraham and and to use them to bless all nations through the promised Savior. They could easily have lost heart and settled in a less threatening region. <clears throat> Once they got into the land, they easily could have started quarreling over 
who got which piece of real estate. Moses reporting of Jacob prophecies showed Israel that each tribe had a different inheritance from the Lord, so they needed to be content with his provision and not fight other who got what. So this prophecy also illustrates the important lesson about how God works. <clears throat> Jacob pictures going down the line from the son to sons. First, Joseph, <clears throat> Jacob illustrates that God chose according to his grace, not human merit. If God's choice were according to merit, <clears throat> He would have chosen Esau over Jacob, Joseph over Judah. But God's choice is part is apart from human merit so that no one can boast before God. And second, same time, it shows that when a man turns to the Lord in repentance, the Lord will bless him. Judah had truly repented to his sin. When we read in chapter 44, verse 16 of this chapter, we see there, he confessed before Joseph, what can we speak? How can we justify ourselves? God has found out the iniquity in our servant. His eloquent, heartfelt appeal to Joseph asking that he is substitute to Benjamin, Benjamin <clears throat> and revealed the depth of Judah's repentance. Moses wanted his readers to know that no matter how great their past sins, if they would now turn to the Lord in repentance, the Lord will bless them greatly by His grace. No matter our past sins, if we turn now to the Lord in repentance, the Lord will bless us with greatly with His grace. And final reason Moses shared these prophecies with his widow was to instill in them the hope of God's salvation through the Messiah. One would rise up from the tribe of Judah and to him will be the vigilance of the people. Even though some great man will come from some of the tribes and do great exploits, through, the, through deliverance will come only from the Lord. <coughs> Salvation will come through the mighty man of Dan, as we saw in the chapter. <coughs> But salvation is only from the Lord. <clears throat> and what's the purpose of these prophecies for us? Based upon the purpose of these prophecies for Jacob's sons and for Moses' first reader, it seems to be that in the bottom line, there is also a purpose of these prophecies for us. <clears throat> but we need to cooperate with God's plan which centered in Jesus Christ. Which centered in Jesus Christ. First, God has planned for history. <clears throat> That's obvious. We know that God has planned for history. But we lose sight of it so easily in the daily routine and pressures of life. Even as the Lord's people, it's easy to fall into the daily schedules of going to work, taking care of our kids, and dealing with all the hosses of people's <clears throat> hassles of people, it's easy to fall into the day <clears throat> that the life that our life will lose sight of God's great purpose or for history. 
we become spiritually dull so that we miss the opportunity to further God's plan. We read about war or strife in some far corners of the world and we shrug our shoulders when we ought to pray for God's purpose to be done in those places. We hear a missionary to, who lacked support and we think that's too bad but in other but it never occurs to us that God wants us to, to cut our spending habits so that we can share some blessing to help those missionaries or to support them. <clears throat> a neighbor share a problem and we say, I'm sorry to hear that, but we don't speak out to tell him or her about the Lord Jesus Christ who wants to transfer him from the kingdom of darkness to his own kingdom where there is forgiveness of sins and hope of for eternity. Second, God, plan, God has planned for us within his plan for history. Each of these brothers was unique. Each had a unique contribution to make to Israel's history. While not all would be as Judah or Joseph, all were essential to God's plan for Israel. They needed to see their roles as complementary, not competitive. <clears throat> So it also applies to us as in the body of Christ. <clears throat> some have one role, some another. Some have one measure of blessing of their lives. Some are another's. But man is without a purpose. Each one complements the other so that every member is essential for the outworking of God's program. Each of every one of us is essential for the outworking of God's program. <clears throat> we don't have to be just like each other or do the same things. It's not more spiritual to be in full-time ministry or opposed to that being a secular job. What matter is that we are doing what God wants us to do in line with his plan for history. Keep our eyes off of others and on the Lord. And this will lead us to the God's plan center on the person of Christ. God's plan is not a religious system. God's plan center to a person and, our, and on our being rightly related to that person. We are to follow Christ. Jacob promising to Judah points to the Savior. The Lord Jesus Christ descended from the tribes of Judah. <clears throat> Jacob predicts, predicts preeminence and power for the tribes of Judah comparing him to a lion. Yeah. Then he predicts, the scepter shall not depart from Judah, nor the ruler stop from between his feet until Silo comes. And who is that Silo? Yeah. Who or what is Silo? Yeah. <clears throat> all, most all commentators Jewish and Christian recognize this as a sort of preference to the Messiah. <clears throat> the word may be a construction of two Hebrew words, meaning he to whom, until he comes to whom it belongs, then the septuagint is 
took it and they arrived in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Thus it would look at Jesus as the peace, as the Prince of Peace, the only one who can give peace to the troubled world and rest to our souls because he alone can reconcile us to God, Amen. our Lord Jesus Christ. <clears throat> Having made peace through the cross, it is only when we are in obedience to him that we have rest in our soul. And God's plan requires our response if we want to share his blessings. <clears throat> In God's time and way, these prophecies about Jacob's sons would be fulfilled. But the individual within the tribes had a choice about whether they would help to fulfill them through obedience to God or fight against their fulfillment through disobedience. It's the same with us. God's plan for the age will be accomplished but we have the choice either to be involved in the fulfilling that plan or in resisting it. <clears throat> the personal history of Judah ought to encourage us. He was a man who was a visible beginning, but who repented of his sin and inherited a great future. God offers that same blessing to each of us. If we turn, if we'll turn from our sins and trust the Lord Jesus Christ sent from God in fulfillment of these prophecies uttered by Jacob, then God will bless us beyond the measures. God wants us to impart his blessing to our children Genesis 49 verses 22 to 28 it shows how we can bless our children to bless our children is help them to interpret life in light of God's perspective <clears throat> help our children to interpret life in light of God's perspective. There are lessons that we can learn on this last verses of this chapter 49. The lesson of, we see is the lesson of fruitfulness. God wants his children to be fruitful. We need to encourage them to be fruitful, which is God's centered, not self-centered. Lives to be lives for not isn't to be lives for ourselves. Jesus called us to bear much fruit in John chapter 15. Just as Joseph's fruitful vine ran over the wall so that the Egyptians were blessed, so we need to teach our children our responsibility to be a blessing to people or other culture who have not heard the good news. Of Christ. Also, we learn the lesson of strength. Not apart from fruitfulness, we will learn also the lesson of strength. We need to teach our children that our strength is not from ourselves, but from the Lord. Our kids need to see, to see that the daily go to God for strength from His Word. We need to see that through prayer, we lay hold of God's resources. As a father or as a mother, we need to pray often with and for your children. Let them see that we are weak, but that God, that God we trust is mighty. We need to see them that we are weak, but that the God we trust is mighty. The third lesson, apart from fruitfulness and strength, 
we have the lesson of trials. <clears throat> a godly life does not mean a life exempt from trials. In fact, fruitfulness often comes only through trials. <clears throat> Joseph was most godly of Jacob's sons, and yet he suffered the most. And Joseph came through it all with a lack of bitterness toward God or toward any of those who had wronged him because he trusted in the sovereignty and he trusted in the sovereign and loving God. Our kids need to know that while following God has its benefits, it also has its trial. It's not like it's not like a bed of roses. We communicate this through our example. Are we committed to the Lord as long as everything is going well but we'll fall away when problems hit? Do we complain about people who have wronged us and grieve about the trials we encountered? <clears throat> as we are we a Christian dads or mom imparting God's blessing to our children? Of course. There is no such thing as a perfect human father or mother because we're all sinners. But perfection isn't the requirement. Reality with God is our kids need God's blessings in part to us. We give it to them by walking daily with God and helping them to do the same. <clears throat> That's the end of chapter 49. <laughs> so now we come to the end of the, chap the end chapter of Genesis. Are you still there? Yeah. Are you still listening? Or you are sleeping? <laughs> Here we got the title of our message. God man it all. Man it good. <laughs> we see we, we have seen <laughs> in chapter 15 we will see from 15 to 20. Here is the word forgiving one another. Forgiving one another. It's a difficult word. Especially when somebody wronged you. <clears throat> we are to be kind and tender hearted, forgiving one another, just God in Christ has forgiven us, says Ephesians 4, verse 32. <clears throat> it's easy so, to say that, but it's tough to apply it. <clears throat> the difficult increases in proportion to how badly you have been hurt. When have been hurt badly, we don't feel like forgiving a person, <clears throat> even if he repents. At least not until he suffers a while, you want him to know what it feels like. You want him to pay. <clears throat> Some of us here are struggling with those feelings right now. <clears throat> Our pain may be from the recent situations or it may back, go back for years, you know? but it will be bitter and unforgiving. We're not obeying, we're not obeying the two great commandments. If we are bitter and unforgiving, we are not obeying the two great Commandments to love God and to love others. <clears throat> Bitterness not only displays God, it spreads to others, defiling many, as Hebrews 12 15 says. So if we want to please God, 
God and God and others, we must ask, how can we root out? How can we root out our bitterness and truly for and truly forgive those who have wronged us? Joseph had to avoid bitterness, had to avoid bitterness and learn to forgive. He had been repeatedly hurt, but he didn't develop a trace of bitterness. His own brothers had planned to kill him, but sold him into slavery at the last moment. As Potiphar slaves, Joseph life is a classic lesson on how to overcome bitterness. He was full faithful and rightful, but was falsely accused of attempted rape by Potiphar's wife. He spent years in prison and was forgotten by a man he had helped who could have pled in case with Potiphar. Yet in spite of all this, Joseph never grew bitter toward God or toward those who had wronged him. <clears throat> to forgive others, we must take our proper place before God and express the proper attitude toward others as Joseph did. <clears throat> Joseph's attitude was the key to his great success in life. First, to forgive others, we must take our proper place before God. When Joseph's brothers approached him, his spontaneous response was to weep, which showed his tender heart. Then he reassured his brothers and us. Am I in God's place? In verse 19 of this chapter, even though Joseph was the second most powerful man on the face of the earth, a man who could have given the command and had his brother in prison or executed with no question us, Joseph didn't forget that he was not in God's place. He assumed his prosperous place, his proper place under God. Joseph question is a good one to ask yourself or ourselves when our tempted to withhold forgiveness, when we are tempted to withhold forgiveness or to seek offense against someone who has wronged us. Am I in God's place? Joseph was powerful in the world's eyes, but he knew he was never big enough to take God's place. To take our proper place before God involves three things. First things, we must allow God to be the judge of all. We must allow God to be the judge of all. In Romans 12 verse 19 says, the Lord says, Vengeance is mine. I will repay. He's the only competent judge. The one who knows the thought and intention of every person's heart. We need to trust him to deal rightly with each person. Most of us want God's justice for the guys who wronged us, but God be mercy for ourselves. But to love our neighbors as ourselves means that we need we will, we will want God's mercies for them or for him, just as we want it for ourselves. <clears throat> So Joseph forgave his brother is that he always remembered that he had no claim against God, no matter how severe the treatment he received. He allowed God to be the judge of his brother and of himself. 
taking our proper place before God means we must humble ourselves under God's sovereignty. We must humble ourselves under God's sovereignty. When terrible things happen to us, we have two options. God is sovereign and for some reason he allowed it to happen or God is unsovereign and this one is lived by him. The Bible declares that God is a sovereign God who works all things after the counsel of his will. Ephesians 1, 11. Nothing includes the devil deeds of wicked man can thwart God's plan. Joseph saw this clearly. He says to his brother, us and us for you, you meant evil against me, but God meant it for good in order to bring about this present result to preserve many people's lives. Verse 20 of chapter 15. That's what a great perspective to have when people wrong you. You meant evil against me, but God meant it for good. <clears throat> we must believe that God is good in all his ways. <clears throat> we meant it for evil, but God meant it for good. That's the Old Testament equivalent of Romans 8, 28, as I said earlier. <clears throat> and we know that God causes all things work together for good to those who love God, to those who are the call according to his purpose. When something's wrong us, you need to be on guard. Satan tempted, tempted Eve by getting her to doubt the goodness of God. He implied that God was withhold something good by keeping the forbidden fruit for them, for her. The devil will tempt us by whispering, if God really cares for us, he wouldn't have this to happen. <clears throat> no doubt, Joseph often had to resist the temptation over the years. But in its case, Joseph affirms by faith they meant it for evil, but God meant it for good. There's a way you can tell whether you have taken your proper place before God or not. <clears throat> Do you grumble about your circumstances or about the people who have mistreated you? If you do, you aren't in submission to the sovereign goodness of God. If you grumble, <clears throat> then you are not in submission to the sovereign goodness of God. You may not think you're grumbling against God. You say you're angry with the person who did you wrong, but really you're angry at God grumbling against him for allowing it to happen. You've got to deal with our attitude before God or our lives and or we live and die a bitter and forgiving person. We must come to a place where we can say that person it made for evil but God meant it. For good and I submit to trust and trust his purpose in it. To forgive others, we must express the proper attitude toward them. To express the proper attitude toward them, to forgive others, we must be humble as Joseph did. <clears throat> Don't use prop, you don't use your power to make the other person pay for what they did. Joseph could have made his brother pay dearly for their sins. He could have enslaved in prison or killed them and their children. 
He doesn't have let them sweat under the fear that someday the ox might fall. But Joseph reassured his brother with the word, do not be afraid. The real test of forgiveness is when we have the power to make the other person pay, but we choose not to use it. Forgiveness absorbs the wrong act. The wrong others have done without exacting payment. If there's payment, there's no need for forgiveness. If there's payment, there's no need for forgiveness. <clears throat> Second, you don't keep score. This is what the usual things we do, keeping scores. <laughs> Joseph didn't say, you guys owe me big time, so now the dog guns pay up. No, Joseph wasn't keep paying his score. There are Christians who carry a scoreboard. <laughs> a scoreboard. And somebody wrong, they write. And somebody wrong there, oh no, the Lavana. <laughs> you got two once more, and you will see. <laughs> they keep track of every wrong their mate has ever done they stay in power by reminding them of the score they can forget what someone at church said about them doesn't matter if the person has sought their forgiveness that's good counsel throw away the scoreboard forgive and forget it <clears throat> You don't put the offenders down. If you want to forgive others, you don't keep the offenders down. If you want to forgive others, you don't take offense easily. And if you want to forgive others, you don't remind the offenders of how you're right, of how we are right, and how they are wrong. Joseph brothers came and fell down before him in verse 18 of chapter 15. Guess what flashes into his mind? His dreams from years before. But Joseph didn't say, Hey guys, remember my dreams? I was right and you're wrong. God has vindicated Joseph and exalted him. him but Joseph didn't exalt himself. <clears throat> to forgive others, we must speak the truth in love. Joseph brothers did not say to him, if you wrong you somehow, we're sorry. <clears throat> but Joseph speak the truth and he said to his brother <clears throat> that they have wronged. They hurt him. They have wronged him. He said to them, you meant evil against me. True forgiveness doesn't deny the offense or cover it as if it didn't hurt, but neither it is, it, is it brutal in rubbing in it. For healing to take place, the offender person need to admit his guilt and know that you heard him. Joseph brothers needed to hear him agree that they had wronged him because they couldn't be sure he had forgiven them until they were sure that the offense was in the open. To forgive others, we must active care. We must active care if we forgive others. Joseph could have said, I forgive you guys. Now get out of my life. <laughs> I forgive you, but I don't want to just see you anymore. <laughs> he didn't say that. <clears throat> but instead, he provided personally to them, their families, his word of forgiveness proved themselves in his kind deeds for deeds long after the fact. Words are nothing if they aren't backed up by action. 
Words are nothing if they aren't backed up by action. If you say that you forgive someone, but you couldn't care, care less what happened to him after that, you haven't really forgiven them. A forgiving spirit shows itself in kind deeds. <clears throat> And in verse 20 of this chapter, we see that God meant it for good. So in every ways, God blesses Joseph. God prosper Joseph. So we see here in the last uh, verses of chapter 50 of this Genesis, the truly successful man is one who succeeds spiritually with his family. The truly successful man is one who succeeds spiritually with his family. A successful life is not measured by its length. Even though Joseph lived relatively long by today's standard, he didn't live as long as his father. 147 years of Jacob's life. Of his grandfather who lived 180 years. But Joseph enjoyed the blessing of God with his family and he left them with his strong faith and hope in God yet to be fulfilled <coughs> promises. A truly successful man is content with the blessing of family. <coughs> Moses as woven in theme throughout the book of Genesis, his outline is to trace the generation of various families. Beginning in the first family, as since it is recurring praise, there are the records of these generations. When you see, when you read Genesis from <coughs> chapter 1 till chapter 50, you will see the praise. These are the records of this generation. God began his work in history with families. The blood, he saved one family and began over again with them. Then he singled out Abraham and promised <coughs> to give him <coughs> just the son and to his descendant to bless all the people on the earth. Abraham's guns on Jacob and 12 sons. <clears throat> so others, a truly successful man is an impressed with worldly success. A truly successful man is an impressed with worldly success. <clears throat> Joseph was about to die. He left his family the greatest inheritance any man can leave, not money, but faith and hope in God's promises. I am about to die, but God will surely take care of you. You and your you and bring you up from this land to the land which he promised to owe on oath to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And Joseph made the son of Israel swear, saying, God will surely take care of you, and you shall carry my bones up from there, the promised land. To sum up the book of Genesis, it tells us about who God is. The book of Genesis also tells us about who we are and it tells us of what we must do. <clears throat> On the 50 chapters of Genesis that is the message for us. God tells us who Genesis tells us who God is. Genesis tells us who we are and Genesis tells us what we must do. And in closing, in Romans 10, 
felt to be thin, Paul tells us that the Lord is abounding in riches for all who will come upon him or whoever wills call upon his name of the Lord will be saved. How then shall they call upon him in whom they have not believed? And how shall they believe in him whom they have not heard? And how shall they hear without a preacher? And how shall they preach unless they are sent? Just as it is, just as it is written, how beautiful are the feet of those who bring blood tidings of good things. God wants those beautiful feet to be your feet and my feet. How beautiful are the feet to those who bring glad tidings of good things. And God wants those feet to be our feet. Genesis 6 tells us God who is, who we are, and what we must do. God has gracious redeemed us from the counts for the from the curse of sin so that we may be his channel for blessing all people. Let's obey the message of Genesis. Father, we thank you, God, for this wonderful message of Genesis, O God. We see of Lord in the book of Genesis who you are and who we are and what we must do to fulfill your great plan in this world. Lord, help us to be the channel of blessing all nations, O God, by cheering, by uh, reaching and teaching thy word and by sharing and proclaiming our Lord Jesus Christ for the salvation of the world. We do God in Jesus' mighty name we pray. Amen. Amen.